Hey everybody, welcome to our second webinar of three. This is the webinar for educators. Um, I'm Cheyenne Homan, I'm the director of the Free Music Archive, and I'm joined today by Jane Park, who works for Creative Commons. Jane, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Jane. I've been with Creative Commons for many years now, working in the research, education, and culture space. Um, I'm currently a project manager, and I manage the School of Open, which is a volunteer community um, of people around the world who are running open education training programs in their regions. And I also help to further Creative Commons adoption in platforms like Vimeo and Flickr and YouTube. So I'm happy to be here to talk about how um, Creative Commons resources can be used by educators um, and by your students in the classroom. Excellent. Yeah, so to get started, we're going to um, share a presentation that we've put together for you all. And I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to get to it. So, OK, so this is um, Music for Educators, as presented by the Free Music Archive and Creative Commons. And I'm Shane Homan, and Jane Park is my colleague today, guest host. Um, so Jane, as she said, works for Creative Commons, and I work for the Free Music Archive. Um, just a little bit of background on the Free Music Archive. Um, it was started as a repository for free and Creative Commons licensed music, including live recordings and public domain works. And it's affiliated with and founded by WFMU, which is a world-renowned freeform non-commercial radio station. And the Free Music Archive was developed basically to be a sort of a safe haven for artists who want to share their work under a Creative Commons license. Um, so it's a curated collection, it's a collection that is very diverse, and it's all free. Um, like I said, it's free. It's always growing. We have new submissions every day, uh, whether it be for a contest we're having or just some of our curators uploading new or interesting things that they've found. And currently, we have almost 80,000 Creative Commons licensed tracks. Um, so far, it's the largest curated repository for Creative Commons music online. So it's kind of a good resource for people who are looking for that sort of thing. Um, and then, Jane, would you like to talk about Creative Commons history? Sure. Okay. So Creative Commons, um, basically it is, it was established in 2001, so let's see, let's do the math here. It was, that's 13 years ago, um, which means it's turning 14 this year. Um, and it was established back then uh, when copyright was becoming an increasing concern for educators, but also other creators of all kinds. Um, so Creative Commons was started essentially as um, an alternative to the existing regime to give creators more options and how they could manage their copyright and how they could share their works online, especially um, with the internet and the kind of vast amount of information resources available. So a lot of people are um, confused when it comes to Creative Commons. They think that um, with Creative Commons licenses you're giving up your copyright when in fact the opposite is true. With Creative Commons licenses you're actually maintaining your copyright. You're just simply expressing uh, which permissions you want to allow the public um, to um, be able to use your work and which permissions you want to reserve. So that's basically Creative Commons in a nutshell. So Creative Commons, um, if I was to explain it very briefly and simply to someone, I would say that our goal as a nonprofit organization is to make sharing content easy, legal, and scalable um, because traditional copyright law was designed for old distribution models before the internet. Um, so back before 1976, uh, copyright was actually a very limited term. It was every 15 to 14 years you had to go renew it and register your copyright at the Copyright Office. Um, but then after 1976, they extended the copyright term to life plus 70 years for an author um, and 120 years for corporate works. And so at a time when um, technological change was advancing at this alarming rate, copyright laws were kind of going backwards in time. And so you know, in 2001, people recognized that this was um, very confusing for creators and for users of digital works. Um, that's why Creative Commons was founded, to make it easier for creators to share their works online to manage their copyright. So with Creative Commons licenses, basically creators can grant copy and reuse permissions in advance to the public, um, to educators, to students, to scientists, to um, users of all kinds. And Creative Commons we do that by offering six free copyright licenses and two public domain tools that anyone can use for free. We're a nonprofit. We're funded by foundations and by public donations. So all of these licenses are free for you to use. And so here is the spectrum of Creative Commons licenses. So basically, 
our public domain tools exist for people to relinquish their copyright if they so choose, and then at the other end there is the all rights reserved copyright, which you automatically get at the instant of creation, especially in the U.S. at the instant of creation it's automatic, you don't have to register your copyright, and then in between we have the, we have the Creative Commons licenses that we offer, and depending on which permissions you want to allow and which ones you want to reserve, you can choose one of the six licenses along the spectrum of most open, public domain, to most closed, which is all rights reserved copyright. Basically, all of our six copyright licenses are made up of these four license elements, and you can mix and match them, and they'll resu result in the six licenses. So the first license element is attribution, and all of our licenses require attribution, which means that you have to give credit to the original creator. Um, the second element is share alike. Um, this is known as the copyleft condition because it kind of derives from the free software, open software world, um, where you're required to share alike if you make a derivative of any um, work. So for example, if you translate a document from English into French, then you're required to share your French translation under the same exact terms as the original work was under. And that's what the share alike condition adds. Non-commercial is pretty self-explanatory. Um, if you want to prohibit commercial uses of your work, then you would add a non-commercial condition. And if you don't want to allow people to change your work significantly, you don't want them to translate it without your permission, you would add the no derivative works condition. So these four elements mix and match to result in these six different licenses. And you can see at the top, there's CC BY. It's the most open liberal license because you can basically do anything you want with work that's under this license, including uh, use it for commercial purposes, including remixing it, translating it, um, as long as you give credit to the original creator. And then you can see it goes all the way to the most restrictive license at the bottom, which is attribution on commercial no derivative works, which is basically um, a license that lets you use that work verbatim. You can redistribute it, copy it, but you can't change it significantly so that it results in an adaptation and you can't use it for commercial purposes. So along the spectrum, you basically choose whichever license um, works for you. And in addition to our six copyright licenses, we offer two public domain tools. Um, for the most part, especially if you're using the Free Music Archive, I don't think you'll have to worry about these. Um, Cheyenne, remind me if CC0 or public domain um, is an option in Free Music Archive. Because I uh, don't. <laughs> yeah, CC0 and public domain are both options on mm -hmm. the um, free Music Archive. However, uh, as you all probably know, public domain can be tricky to indicate. Um, CC0 is actually the license that we're using currently to license all of the works that have been submitted for our micro song contest. And those oh, are songs okay. that are 15 seconds or shorter. So it's been kind of a fun contest if anybody wants to check it out. Um, yeah, but there are works that have been licensed completely, like as openly as possible. Okay, cool. Well, so for um, so then CC0, I'll explain. CC0 is an option if you're using Free Music Archive and you're a musician and you want to release your songs into the public domain, then you would use CC0 to relinquish all of your copyrights to that um, piece of music. And that would effectively place it in the public domain. And that's the, one, the extreme end of the spectrum where you're pretty much giving up all your rights and you, you don't even require people to credit you. Um, you can ask them to credit you, but they're not legally required to do so with CC0. The other public domain tool that we offer is a public domain mark, which we don't really recommend for use by individuals because it's more of a label um, to add to works that are already in the public domain, works that have expired, works that were created before 1923. And so for that to be verified, it usually requires researchers um, and institutions like libraries and archives and museums um, do that work. So the public domain mark is really kind of just a label that institutions add to works that have already passed into the public domain. Whereas CC0 is a legally operable tool, just like the licenses for you to express um, that your rights have been waived in that work. So those are our two public domain tools. And if you see a piece of music on the free music archive under CC0, that means that it's in the public domain. You can basically do whatever you want with it. So when it comes to um, all of our six licenses and our CC0 tool, um, they are all designed uniquely for the digital landscape for the internet age. They're all made up of three layers, which basically is a fancy way of saying that we communicate the licenses in three different ways. So we communicate it one way for lawyers, one way for humans, which is, you know, for normal people like um, everyone in this audience. 
and then one way for machines. So at the base layer, um, all of our licenses in the CC0 tool has a, is a legal document. Um, it's been created and drafted by lawyers and vetted by lawyers from around the world, and this is to ensure that our licenses would stand up in a court of law. And it's been globally vetted so that it would stand up against international copyright law as well. Um, and then on top of that, so this is an example of a lawyer readable legal code. You can see it's very long and most people don't read it. Um, however, if you're interested, we do recommend you read it. But um, because most people won't read that, that's why we've developed the second layer of the licenses known as a human readable deed, um, which is basically a summary of the long legal document um, into a few simple terms and conditions that um, most people can understand, especially educators and students. So you can see here that it says very simply um, what you can and can't do with the work. And then the last layer of our licenses is the machine-readable metadata, um, and this is what really makes our licenses viable for the Internet age. It's basically what allows Google to index um, a CC license work and um, allows you to just discover a CC license works. Um, and the Free Music Archive, I believe, um, has a machine readability all baked into it. So you don't have to worry about it. So if you're licensing a work, um, your piece of music on Free Music Archive, you simply use a drop-down license chooser tool that's already embedded within the platform, and it'll take care of the machine-readable aspect for you. Um, and we also have a chooser tool, which I'll show you in a moment, um, that does this for you. So you don't have to worry about coming up with this code yourself. Um, we have done the code for you, and all you have to do is copy and paste it, um, depending on where you use it. All of our licenses, as I mentioned before, um, have been globally vetted by lawyers, and currently we um, have over 300 volunteers in 80 different jurisdictions or countries around the world that work with us um, to translate our licenses into different languages and to make sure that our licenses align to copyright laws in those countries um, and to international copyright law. And we just keep growing our network every year. So at the end of last year, we did issued a State of the Commons report, which is actually um, pretty interesting because the last time previous to that that we had issued a State of the Commons report was in 2010, and back then we counted um, about 400 million Creative Commons licensed works. Last year we um, worked with Google and other partners to get search engine estimates regarding you know how many CC license works there are existing on the internet right now, and so 882 million is the current number, which is a lot. Um, it's grown a lot since we started in 2001, and that's actually a very conservative estimate because not everyone has linked to the Creative Commons licenses or properly marked their website with the machine-readable code, and so there's probably a lot uh, more millions of works that we haven't counted as part of that, and we're going to issue another State of the Commons report at the end of this year. But of those 882 million works, um, we found that 58% of them um, allowed commercial uses, which means that they were under one of the CC licenses that allow commercial uses, so without the non-commercial condition. And we found that 76% allowed adaptations, which means it didn't have the no derivative works condition. And so we found that since 2010, actually more and more people were licensing their works under uh, licenses that allowed commercial uses and allowed adaptations, which is great because those works can be um, remixed more freely um, and they are, you know, they pretty much represent a very kind of rich, robust commons of materials that educators can use, um, and especially students when they're using it for their reports, remix video projects, it's important that they choose works under licenses that allow derivative works. So many of those millions of works that were counted are open educational resources. So many of you probably have heard of MIT OpenCourseWare, um, the Khan Academy. These are all educational resources that are under Creative Commons licenses. Um, the Creative Commons licenses have served as sort of the legal and technical infrastructure of the open educational resources movement since it began around the same time as Creative Commons started. So, um, yeah, Creative Commons licenses are pretty much what make open educational resources possible and allow people to learn for free online and to remix uh, and build upon those materials. So, I don't know, did you want to do the lead-in or...? Sure, yeah. Um, the, uh, the next portion we're going to get to is just sort of these scenarios that we've invented that seem like they might be applicable to your classroom or situation that you can imagine putting in a lesson plan. So the first one is a student podcast. 
uh, to help students learn how to use audio equipment, editing software, and build storytelling skills, you want your students to produce short podcasts. So to do that, which licenses could you use? You can use music uh, from the Free Music Archive or other sources under these Creative Commons licenses. CC BY, which is attribution, BY SA, which is attribution share alike, BY NC, which is attribution non-commercial, or BY NCSA, which is attribution non-commercial share alike. Yeah, so um, I think um, because if a student is going to be creating a podcast and they'll probably be remixing the audio or the music, which means that they're going to uh, require music that allows derivative works, which is why those four licenses are shown. All of those four licenses allow the student to remix um, the piece of music um, using editing software. So yeah, if you're looking for music on the Free Music Archive for students to use in podcasts, those are the licenses um, that should govern the music that they're going to find and remix. Right. So the next scenario is a student film. Um, depending on what kind of resources you have, you may ask students to use video equipment or maybe mobile uh, handheld devices to record video and edit those things together into either a report, a skit, a piece of art, what have you. Um, so to help students learn how to use video equipment, editing software, and build storytelling skills, you want your students to produce short films. Um, for those, you can use similar array of licenses. Um, CC BY, BY SA, BY NC, and BY NCSA. Um, Jane, do you want to talk a little bit about ShareAlike in this case? Sure. Um, first, let me say that um, because um, whenever you overlay a music track to video moving images, that is um, considered a derivative work when it comes to the CC licenses, which is why you're going to have to want to find music that allows derivative work. Um, so the same as previous with the podcast. Um, and then when it comes to the share it like licenses, um, if a student finds music that's under CC by SA or CC by NCSA and they overlay that music track to moving images, they would have to license their resulting work under the same license because the share like condition requires that if you make a derivative work, then you are required to share your derivative work under the same terms as the original work. So if they find a piece of music that's a bias A and they put it over one of their images and they release a video, then they would have to license that video under bias A. If they found a piece of music under by NCSA and they did the same thing with one of their images, then they would have to license their resulting video under by NCSA. Um, that's because the share light condition gets triggered whenever they create a derivative work. All right. Thanks, Jane. Um, and the last one is a student remix um, to take existing works and mix them into something new. So this could be sort of the same idea as before with a video or pictures to music, uh, mixing multiple audio tracks together or sampling pieces, um, maybe spoken word over uh, some orchestral work or something like that. So again, um, the following Creative Commons licenses are applicable for this. Um, attribution, attribution share alike, attribution non-commercial or attribution non-commercial share alike. Um, the one that hasn't been showing up on this list is no derivatives, which is uh, ND. If you see that on something, then our best advice is to find something that is licensed in the way that you can use it or to contact the artist um, and see if you can work something out with them. Um, yeah, so that's a good point, Cheyenne. Um, whenever um, you come across a piece of music or other work under CC licenses, but you want to be able to use it um, beyond the permissions of the license, like you want to be able to remix something that you find under no derivatives, you can always contact the creator of the work and ask for that permission. Um, the CC licenses is just, you know, a baseline starting point for you to start a conversation if you want to do something more with that work. Yeah, so then um, on the next slide we have a note about the non-derivatives license. If students are not remixing but just using a work verbatim without making any changes, then they can use the content under any of the Creative Commons licenses, including by at, or attribution no derivatives or by NCND, which is attribution non-commercial no derivatives. Yeah, so this is an important point. Um, an example of this is if a student finds an image that they want to use in their report, like a picture of a snake, and it's under uh, no derivative 
um, license. As long as they don't make a derivative work of the image, they don't change the image, they can use the image verbatim in their report um, as long as they give credit um, and state that the license of the image was originally under. Yeah, so attribution is the foundation of most of these licenses and it's good practice anyway in schools to be able to cite your sources. So, um, Do you want to talk a little bit more about how to find music for student projects? Sure. So students in schools are going to be using, can use CC licenses in a variety of ways. So the first way is they can find Creative Commons licensed music on the Free Music Archive and they can find other kinds of media such as photos or videos on other platforms. Um, a second way that students will be using CC licenses is once they find um, the CC license materials, they should give credit to the creators of the CC license materials that they use in their work. And the third way that they're going to be using CC licenses is if they want to choose a Creative Commons license for their own work. And that's actually a very valuable exercise for them to go through because then it kind of puts them in the position of the creator and gets them to think about, well, how would I want to share my own work? Um, and it gets them to respect kind of the original creator and um, giving credit to creators. So in terms of the first way where students can actually find CC licensed resources, so they can go to search.creativecommons.org, and we're actually in the middle of um, improving CC search, but um, at search.creativecommons.org you can see here there's a variety of platforms that CC search searches across. So CC search isn't necessarily a search engine, but it is a portal to different websites and platforms and search engines that have enabled Creative Commons license filters. And so this is um, kind of a one-stop place for students and educators to go to find CC license resources. And you can see here that um, YouTube is here, Wikimedia Commons, CC Mixer, SoundCloud. Free Music Archive is actually not here, <laughs> ironically. But you can um, search for CC license music directly on Free Music, free music Archive as well. Um, once students find CC license materials that they want to use, um, you want to make sure that they give proper credit to the creator of that CC license resource and we've come up with some best practices for giving credits um, at that link wiki.creativecommons.org best practices for attribution um, and it can pretty much be summed up with this acronym which is very easy for students to remember um, TASL or TASL um, and T stands for title of the resource, A stands for author of the resource so those are two pretty self-explanatory things. And then S stands for source, um, and usually this means a link back to the where the original work sits, so a URL. And then L stands for license, um, which is actually very important. You always want to um, mention the li license that the original work was under, so the name of the license, whether it's CC BY or CC BY ND. Um, and then you also want to link to the deed of that license, because uh, if someone comes across that work, they they want to be able to click on the deed and remember that human readable deed it tells you exactly what they can and can't do with the work. So title, author, source, license, tassel, if your students remember that then they can um, give um, a best practice attribution for a Creative Commons licensed work that they use. So an example of a best um, or an ideal attribution we have it at that wiki page that I mentioned. So here is a photo um, of this is actually from the 10th birth anniversary, 10th birthday of Creative Commons a couple years ago in San Francisco and we had CC cupcakes and someone took a picture. It was actually by one of our staff members, um, Tival, and you can see here that this is an ideal attribution for this image. So if a student were to take this um, image from Tival's Fooker page, then they would want to um, give attribution in this way. You can see here um, that the title is Creative Commons 10th Birthday Celebration San Francisco and that's been clearly uh, laid out there. The author is Tval and it's linked to his Flickr profile page. The source um, is linked there from the title. It links back to the original Flickr page and it's linked to the actual license deed. So this is an ideal attribution that has all four pieces of information. So um, when it comes to using music off the Free Music Archive, um, there's going to be a it's going to be a little bit more complicated when, when it comes to giving um, credit, especially when um, students are creating works that are in multimedia format, such as videos or podcasts. So we also, on that same wiki page, um, provide um, examples and instructions for how you might do that. So you could always, with a video, um, you could always have one credits page that flashes at the end of a video that displays all of the relevant information um, that follows the tassel best practices. 
Um, you could always publish a separate web page that has all of the credits info, and you can provide a link to this web page at the end of the video if you can't fit it all in one frame. Or you could have it in the information section of the video if it's hosted on a third-party platform like YouTube. YouTube always has a click to see more information about this video right underneath the video, and that's where you could add in credits information. And you could always mention the credits within the video itself, um, visually, as we mentioned in a frame, or you could always um, give an audio uh, version of it, especially in a podcast when there is no visual component. Um, you could always mention at the end of the podcast um, the different pieces of music that you used and who the authors were. And also on the page that hosts the podcast, you could uh, mention that. So this is um, the last way that students uh, will probably be interacting with CC licenses is if they want to um, choose a Creative Commons license for their own work. So if you go to creativecommons.org slash choose, um, we have license chooser tool there and you can kind of play around with it. It asks you a few questions. Do you want to allow adaptations of your work? Do you want to allow commercial uses of your work? And based on how you want to share your work, you'd say yes or no. And then it automatically changes the option on your right-hand side. And you can see that the default is the CC BY license, which is the most open license. Um, but that will change depending on how you answer the question. So um, this is a great way for students to play around with how they might want to share their work. And then you can see at the bottom right corner it says has a web, have a web page. And this is a tool that takes care of the machine readable code for you. All you have to do is copy and paste that into the editor of your web page. So in WordPress you'd go to um, you know, the HTML screen and you just copy and paste that in there. And then when you display it, it automatically displays a license and automatically links that uh, license icon to the license deed. And then in the bottom left hand field, it, th these are optional fields if you want to add in the title of your work, um, um, the name of yourself as the author, um, and if you have a URL where the work sits. We're going to start talking about how to find stuff on the FMA, which is pretty important. Um, so the first way that you can browse on the FMA is to search by genre. This is a fairly reliable way to find something that is in the style of what you're looking for. However, <laughs> the Free Music Archive is pretty freewheeling and can give fairly loose interpretations of a genre. Um, of course, genres are fairly loose categorizations of types of music. Uh, so if you are looking for a very specific sound uh, or speed, or you're looking for something that sounds like another artist or um, something that is particularly well suited for soundtracking or um, to you know be part of an activity or, or a performance or something um, then you may want to browse start by genre see if there are any artists that you like and look at their catalogs um, additionally you can browse by curator if you know that there's a curator that you particularly like, so for example, if you're looking for um, classical music, you may want to look at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum's page. Uh, if you want to look for fun uh, Creative Commons music that is all over the place, you can look at audio overplay. Uh, WFMU is the radio station that is very connected to the FMA, so they are top. Um, and also we have a section that is specifically uh, arranged to display only music that is licensed for use in video. So that's the second one down if you decide that you want to do that. The CC Community Curator page is solely um, artists who have not been affiliated with a different uh, FMA curator. So that's what they do. Um, lots of different kinds of music represented here. You can play around. If you hit the More button at the bottom of this curator list, you'll find about 200 uh, listings. The search page is the next place to go. If you click on the blank bar, the go bar, and click go, you'll just see everything that's come up. Um, when you first load this page, it is sorted by what date it was added. So it'll be the most recent thing. Um, and if you are looking for something that was posted a long time ago, or uh, if you're looking for something that begins with a certain letter of the alphabet, there are different ways to organize your uh, your search results. The default is by date added and it's most recent. So, um, But as you see on the left side, there are search filters that vary from mood to song title to genre. It's another way to search by genre. Uh, duration, if you want like a very specific length of song. Uh, tempo and license. 
So some that I've found to be very useful have been Tempo. If you want to get something that's very slow and it's kind of soft and you want to uh, score a short film, Tempo can be really helpful, um, or if you're looking for something with lots and lots of energy, instead of just sort of blindly uh, clicking through things, you can search by beats per minute. If you'd rather just search by things that are licensed under specific Creative Commons licenses or that are licensed to allow for commercial use or in a remix or video, we have filters for that. Just click on the ones that you want to look through and they will pop up when you click go. Um, also, if you look on the right side, you'll see a little down arrow and a plus sign. The down arrow is to actually download the track and the plus sign means that it'll add the track to a pop-out player that we have. The pop-out player can be nice because it allows you to scrub through tracks, you can adjust the volume, and you can sort of skip from track to track once you've added them to the pop-out player. Once you find an artist that you want to look through, click on their name and it'll take you to their main page. Uh, it'll show you on the breadcrumb trail right below the FMA logo, the way that you came, which is home always, and then usually the curator or just the artist if, it, if they don't have a curator, and then the artist's name. Uh, this artist has eight tracks on one album, and you can see here that Audio Overplay uploaded that. They are a curator here, uh, and you will see down here more information. You can usually find, um, if you click on Audio Overplay, you'll see everything that they've uploaded. If you like a particular curator's style. Um, you also often have a website that is affiliated with the group. Sometimes these websites are, you know, we've been around for about five years, so sometimes it's a MySpace page that's out of date, um, or it may be a link to their Bandcamp, SoundCloud, Gemendo, or Internet Archive presence, among other things. Sometimes also we'll have information like the location, what, what years the band was active, if they're on a record label, things like that. If you want to contact an artist and you can't find their information, you can do a web search. You can look for the website listed and search for their contact information, or sometimes you can find an email this artist button or a contact link uh, on the artist page. So this is usually on the right side of the page underneath the licensing information. The licensing information, like I said, is on the bottom of the right-hand side. There's a little tab that says License and More Info. Uh, more Info often gives you, if there are different licenses per track, uh, especially on compilations, that's a common thing. You may have to look at each individual track to get the information, but if an entire album, as this one is licensed, um, is licensed under a completely universal one, then you can click on that and it'll show you the, the information. Um, this one is listed under attribution uh, and share alike, so it's by SA, and it'll show you the full uh, text here, the Wind Quintet Opus 67, Numbers 2 and 3, Bosoni Venturum Wind Quintet, is licensed under an attribution share alike 3.0 international license. So that's a really easy way to be able to reference back, and it shows you their sort of nice little icon as well. The licenses, uh, I don't know if Jane mentioned this, but um, abbreviations are okay, you don't have to type out attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives if you don't want to. Most people who are looking at lots of Creative Commons works understand by NCND, so don't feel bad about that. And um, we have a lot of other places to look for music beyond the Free Music Archive, um, so don't be shy to use the rest of the web. As before, Jane showed us the search interface for Creative Commons, and hopefully FMA will be on there soon. Um, also, w Wikimedia Commons has a category for sounds. Gemendo is a place to get easily obtainable Creative Commons licensed and free tracks by a variety of artists. Also, CC Mixer has a lot of remixable chunks of songs um, and a whole community based around that. And SoundCloud also has a wide variety of Creative Commons licensed work. Uh, one that I didn't put on here but that might be useful to you is freesound.org. Um, that is a place where you can find a lot of fully type sound effects, um, smushing, squishing, splashing, <laughs> crunching, crackling. Uh, I know that... Um, a friend of mine was looking for old modem sounds and was able to find that there. So um, those are some interesting places to look. And of course, you can always send us an email if you have questions, uh, contact at freemusicarchive.org. So that's 
it for our presentation. Um, and I'm going to check and see um, if we have any questions. It says in a MOOC about OERs for teachers, some participants had asked the question whether CC BY is more or less open than CC BY SA. BY SA being viral, uh, should it be interpreted more conserving for freedom? Uh, so I'm wondering if, if Jane has anything, uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so that's a great question, Anish. Um, so I would say when it comes to the philosophical debate of whether CC BY is more open or CC BY SA is more open, I would say that's up for philosophical debate and people will say different things. Um, I will say when it comes to technically, legally how the licenses work, CC BY um, has, doesn't have any restrictions on reuse of derivative work. So if you do you know, make a derivative work based on a CC BY license material, you're free to license that work however you want to. And so some people will interpret that as CC BY being um, more liberal. Um, because it doesn't have an additional restriction, whereas by SA is requiring that any derivative works be also shared freely. Um, so Wikipedia uses by SA because their community feels strongly that anything um, that is built from the community should be contributed back to it, and so that you're continually growing that commons of knowledge on Wikipedia, and that's all great. Um, but one practical use where um, CC BY might make more sense than CC BY SA is um, if you're, um, if you're, if you're like a government or an educational institution, and you're giving money um, to develop educational materials that were funded by taxpayer dollars. Um, you probably want to add the CC BY license because it's less restrictive on downstream reuse, um, and you just want um, you know commercial companies to also be able to build off of um, these resources that were paid for by the government. Um, so that would also, when it comes to institutions being able to reuse that material and remix it, they have they might have a lot of different third party stakeholders. Um, and then the CC BY license would make more sense, so they could relicense it however they want under one of the more restrictive CC licenses if they needed to appease certain third parties. So there are just a lot of different hypothetical situations to consider. I would say CC BY is the more open in terms of just it doesn't have that additional restriction to require you to share it freely if you make a derivative work. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. Um, I would, I mean, I love CC by SA because it does sort of spread the Creative Commons licensing, kind of can be educational itself, which I think um, is, like, CC by stuff, I think, because it's not insistent in others sharing alike, that it's not as viral, as you said, um, and therefore maybe not as educational. Um, if you are thinking of like how to keep spreading Creative Commons licensing to works. Um, but yeah, I think that CC BY, um, in terms of reuse and the abilities for people to actually um, do what they want with a work, CC BY is more open. I think especially for musicians, um or for even like documentary filmmakers, if they want to be able to um, find a piece of music and they want to use it in their documentary, um, but they have other other third party stakeholders to appease, so they can't license like the resulting documentary under the same free license, but they can license maybe under like a non commercial license because um, they want to be able to recoup some of the cost of the documentary. Then, you know, finding by licensed music makes sense for them, whereas they wouldn't be able to use by a say licensed music. So there's a whole different, there's, you know, different, different creators um, with different intentions and um, different things, like different third parties to kind of take into consideration there. Yeah, thanks, Jane. Um, I don't think we have any more questions from anybody. Uh, would you like to offer any, like, closing thoughts on students using Creative Commons licensed work or teachers using them, maybe places where they could look for other um, media guides or further sort of resources for them? Yes, definitely. So I just posted it into the chat. I don't know if it'll show up on the live broadcast, but schoolofopen.org. Um, so if you go to schoolofopen.org and you click on online resources or courses, there, there's a lot of great kind of short courses and challenges that students can take to learn more about Creative Commons licenses. If I was too confusing on this webinar, just go to the Get CC Savvy Challenge, and after 30 minutes, you'll have a much better understanding of how Creative Commons licenses work and how you can use them.
Okay, great. Um, yeah, and like I said, this will be archived online and it'll be available on our website. So we're, we're going to also share the slide deck on SlideShare. So if anybody has any more questions, they can always contact us via a YouTube comment, a tweet, a Facebook message, um, or email, smoke signals, whatever. So <laughs> yeah, I'm the person to get a hold of, Cheyenne at freemusicarchive.org or contact at freemusicarchive.org, which is our catch-all. And even if Cheyenne is uh, no longer checking the Free Music Archive's primary email account, contact will always be able to reach that person. So that's an excellent way to get a hold of us. All right. Um, thanks, Jane, so much for coming in this afternoon. It was really, really great to have you join us today and tell us about the School of Open and how to use Creative Commons licenses. Um, I know that a lot of our users are going to get a lot of value out of this presentation. Thanks for hosting and having me. <laughs> Yeah, all right, and thanks for everybody who tuned in, and Anish for your really good question. Um, I'll post links to the School of Open and the Peer-to-Peer -peer University link uh, that Jane shared in this chat in case people miss those in the YouTube comments below. So, all right, thanks so much. Bye.